Hey y'all, welcome back to part 18 of the Unsolved Mystery Mega Iceberg Explained. We took a little break on this series, so I'm anxious to dive back in. We are now at the bottom of layer number 6, and put your thinking caps on, because this one is very science heavy. But before we dive in, as always, let me give a shout out to the members of the channel who make this possible. The Oh My God particle refers to an extremely high energy cosmic ray particle that was detected on October 15, 1991 by the University of Utah's Fly's Eye Cosmic Ray Detector in Dugway Proven Ground, Utah. The particle in question was a proton with an extraordinary amount of energy. The name Oh My God particle was coined by scientists who were reviewing the data and were reportedly so astonished by the particle's energy that one of them wrote, oh my god, on the printout of the data. To put its energy into perspective, the particle had energy equivalent to that of a well-struck tennis ball, but it was contained within a single subatomic particle. The main mystery here is, where these ultra-high energy cosmic rays come from, and how they achieve such enormous energies. The most energetic cosmic rays are challenging to explain. Using traditional astrophysical processes, proposed sources include supernovae, active galactic nuclei, or even more exotic phenomena like cosmic strings or topological defects. There is also a theoretical limit known as the GZK cutoff, which suggests that cosmic rays with energies above a certain threshold should interact with cosmic microwave background radiation and lose energy. The Oh My God particle's energy seems to exceed this limit, raising questions about how it attains such a high energy during its journey through space. Planet 9 is a hypothetical, yet-to-be-discovered planet in our solar system. The idea of Planet 9 emerged as scientists observed unusual patterns in the orbit of distant objects in the Kuiper Belt, a region beyond Neptune that is populated by icy bodies. These observations suggested the gravitational influence of a large, unseen celestial body. The search for Planet 9 began as astronomers noticed the peculiar clustering of orbits for certain trans-Neptunian objects and other distant bodies. The gravitational effects of an unseen massive planet were hypothesized to explain these orbital anomalies. The hypothetical Planet 9 is believed to have an extremely elongated and tilted orbit, taking it far from the Sun at its most distant point and bringing it much closer at its closest approach. The orbit is thought to be inclined relative to the orbital plane of the other planets. Estimates of Planet 9's size vary, but it is generally believed to be 5 to 10 times more massive than Earth, potentially in the range of several Earth masses. Its distance from the Sun is thought to be 400 to 800 times further away from the Sun that the Earth is. The evidence of Planet 9 comes from computer simulations of the solar system's dynamics, which suggest that the observed clustering of distant objects can be explained by the gravitational influence of a distant and massive planet. Some researchers argue, though, that the observed anomalies could be better explained by other factors, such as the gravitational influence of nearby stars, or the combined gravitational effects of numerous smaller objects in the Kuiper Belt. Detecting Planet 9, if it exists, is challenging because of its extreme distance from the Sun and the fact that it would be quite faint. The main mystery here is whether it exists or not. Despite the suggestive evidence from the clustering of distant objects in the Kuiper Belt, as well as computer simulations supporting the idea of an unseen massive planet, no direct observational confirmation has ever been made. The Zapotec were a pre-Columbian civilization that flourished in southern Mexico between 700 BC and 1521 AD in addition to being a country you would not want to play in EU4, the Zapotecs had a capital called Monte Alban. This now archaeological site is the home of monumental buildings, ball courts, and elegant tombs. It was one of the first major cities in Mesoamerica. And you know what? All that is enough to be interesting on its own. But there's actually more, and this is where our mystery lies. Because the first excavation of the site began in 1931, and many things were found in tombs, such as gold, jade, 
rock crystal, and turquoise. But what really stumped archaeologists was this complex network of stone-lined tunnels. And you're probably thinking, so what? The Zapotec could have used those tunnels for anything. But here's the catch. These tunnels were incredibly small, far too small to be used by adults. And even children of average height could never fit in these things. They were only 20 inches high and 25 inches wide. The excavators would lie on their backs and try inching their way through in 1933. After going 195 feet, they came across a skeleton, an incense burner, and funeral urns. They also found more jade, turquoise, and stone, along with a few pearls. Just yards beyond this, the tunnel was blocked, so they had to dig a 25-foot shaft from the surface beyond the blockage. Going further back, they found even smaller tunnels, no more than a foot high, branching off the main tunnel. One of these even went down a tiny flight of steps, and now, 320 feet from the entrance, another skeleton was found. Before the tunnel finally came to an end, further excavations found two similar tunnels packed with clay, but it would be the east of tomb number seven where another complex network of miniature tunnels was discovered. Some of them again, less than a foot high. Smoke was blown into these in an effort to trace their course, and this would begin the mystery. Who or what were these tunnels built for? At first, the excavators assumed it was a drainage system, but that was quickly abandoned due to the tiny staircases that were found. Emergency escape routes were also ruled out because they were too small for that. There's not really any theories for this one that I can find. The rare earth hypothesis is a scientific concept that suggests that complex life as we know it on earth might be rare and possibly unique in the universe. The hypothesis proposes that the conditions necessary for the development of complex life, such as animals and plants, are so specific and uncommon that they may not be prevalent across the cosmos. These conditions include a stable and long-lasting star like the Sun, a large moon to stabilize the planet's axial tilt, a magnetosphere to protect against harmful solar radiation, the Earth's size, location in the solar system, geological activity, and the presence of liquid water may all be pretty rare in the universe. However, critics argue that it is premature to make conclusions about the rarity of complex life based on our limited understanding and observations of the universe. They point out that the discovery of potentially habitable exoplanets and the diversity of extreme environments on Earth suggest that life could exist in a variety of conditions. On February 19, 2005, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 34-year-old Danielle Imbo would go out on a date with 35-year-old Richard Petrone. The two had plans to meet with another couple for drinks at a local restaurant, and after hanging out till around 11.45 p.m., Richard and Danielle would ask this other couple if they wanted to go to another bar, but they both declined, citing they had to get up early for work the next morning. So Richard and Danielle would head back to his truck, where Richard planned on taking Danielle back to her home in New Jersey. And that's where things get odd. The next morning, Danielle would strangely miss her hair appointment. Then, phone calls to both Richard and Danielle were going straight to their voicemail, which was odd because both were extremely close to their family. Richard had a teenage daughter, while Danielle had a two-year-old boy. Their families become concerned, and it's about this time that Danielle's brother would go to check on her using a spare key she had given him. He would go into her apartment and not spot anything suspicious. The family was confused and not sure what to do when Danielle's estranged husband, whom she was going through a divorce with, would bring their two-year-old back to her family's home after not being able to find Danielle. The family covered up for her by saying she would pick her son up later and ask her ex to take care of the boy a little while longer. However, after hours went by with no contact, both families would contact the police. A massive search was launched. They checked waterways and overpasses and organized a grid search that covered over 100 miles in every direction. They carried pictures of Richard's truck and license plate. They even hired a police officer to fly a helicopter above the city, but found not one clue. Detectives spoke to witnesses at the bar who saw the couple walking towards Richard's truck, but that was the last known sighting of the two. Detectives would then go to the local toll bridges 
and pull security footage, hoping to find some clue of the two. But again, this led to nothing. Now there's not a ton out there about this one, but we do know that once the investigation began, the detectives quickly found out that the two had an on and off type relationship. So, did this mean one of them was involved with foul play? Investigators thought not, mainly for two reasons. One, there's never been any activity on either Richard or Danielle's phone, nor has there been activity with their finances. This would start speculation that the two had accidentally drove into the Delaware River. However, people that actually live in that area cited this was very unlikely because there isn't direct access. Another early theory was the two had been carjacked and murdered, with the vehicle taken to a chop shop and sold for parts. And considering that over 13,000 vehicles were stolen in the Philadelphia area in 2004 alone, it made sense. The FBI would pursue this line of thought and work with the Philadelphia Stolen Car Squad, but it too led to nothing. The case went cold, and it would be a decade later when the FBI would finally spark some energy back into the investigation, when in 2014, the FBI special agent in charge of the case would state, making two people and a truck disappear with no witnesses and no evidence of any kind for nine years suggest methodical planning. It's possible a perpetrator could just get lucky, but it's more likely it's just what it looks like. Someone behind this knew what they were doing. They now believed this was a murder for hire plot, but who would want them dead? Well, they had to start with who saw them last, the other couple. But after multiple interviews, detectives were convinced they were not involved. So second, they went to Danielle's estranged husband, and their story is a strange one in itself. Apparently her husband, named Joe, had actually went to the Super Bowl just a year before Danielle's disappearance in 2004. And you're probably wondering, why is that important? Well, Joe, he flew to Houston, leaving behind Danielle and their baby, who both had codes, and would actually arrive back and tell Danielle that he met another woman on the flight and now wanted a divorce. That's right, he was ready to move on that quick. Danielle, who was obviously shocked and hurt, reluctantly gave in and agreed to the divorce. Joe's new relationship, however, ended abruptly, and now he was wanting Danielle to forgive him and take him back. Unfortunately for Joe, Richard was now in the picture, and Danielle at that point was kind of just done with Joe, who was very controlling and short-tempered, so she did not want to stop the divorce. So of course investigators were interested to talk to Joe. They found out that he had an alibi 50 miles away, where he was in attendance at a birthday party. And with this alibi, it's important to note that it came from his father, or stepfather, depending on the source. And that man was a retired NYPD officer. But maybe the bad part for Joe was investigators discovered he had Danielle's voicemail password and had checked it multiple times leading up to her disappearance. Another fact that came up was Joe placed several threatening phone calls to Richard at his home and his job, telling him to stop seeing his wife. You know, the same one he left for another woman he met on the flight. However, he has not been named a suspect or even a person of interest. And some believe that this is due to his father's connection with the NYPD. But there's other speculation that Richard had a gambling debt and was killed over that, and Danielle was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. While others still contend that the two simply ran off into a body of water, and that's pretty much where the case stands today. Sometime after the debut of the cartoon Rick and Morty, the show's creator, Justin Roiland, would be approached by the fast food chain Subway to make a series of commercials featuring characters Rick Sanchez and Marty Smith. These commercials would have the two characters exclaiming they were the new Jared and would begin promoting the products. The new Jared was obviously a nod to Jared Fogle, Subway's main spokesperson at the time. However, shortly before the commercials were set to debut, Subway would cut ties with Jared Fogle due to his arrest on July 7th, 2015, when he was taken in and charged for, well, you know. But due to the fact that the main subject of the commercial was Jared, the ads were canceled. In all, there had been four created, which have never seen the light of day. But what makes this one interesting is Roiland is the only person known to have the commercials and he is not allowed to leak them due to legal threats from Subway. So he did something creative. He put the commercials on eight different thumb drives and littered them in random places. 
He still goes to these places to this day to see if they're still there. And so far, four of the drives remain, meaning the other four have presumably been taken, although that's not a guarantee. I suppose they could have just been picked up and trashed. Regardless, none of the commercials have ever been leaked, and the four remaining thumb drives with the commercials are still out there waiting to be picked up. On April 16th, 2008, 23-year-old Fort Benning soldier Robert Hornbeck had been out on a night bar hopping with an army buddy in Savannah, Georgia. He was set to be picked up by his father afterwards, and he would arrive later on and call Robert to see where to pick him up. But when Robert answered, he would tell his dad, I'm on the stairs. And then, strangely, the connection went dead. His father went to search for him, but didn't see him anywhere around. He was perplexed, and later on, when he seen that this was now an urgent matter, he would contact authorities as well as family. The family members would begin a search, and they spent nearly two weeks combing the Savannah Historic District looking for him, hanging up his photo in store windows and offering a $10,000 reward. Yet, no one came forward, and it would be 12 days later when a downtown hotel would contact a maintenance man after receiving complaints of a foul odor in the lobby. When the repairman arrived, he would go check out the industrial-sized air conditioner, and in an area accessible through a maintenance door, lay Robert's body in the hotel's ductwork. He had been struck by a large spinning blower wheel. It appeared accidental. This is a case sorta like Elisa Lambs, because no one is sure how Hornbeck actually ended up in the maintenance area of the hotel, or even what he was doing there, because he was not a guest. He got inside the hotel through an employee entrance door that was supposed to be locked, yet there was no sign of forced entry. Hornbeck's father stated his belief was that he had too much to drink and simply got confused and ended up in the wrong spot. But for that to have happened, he would have had to cross a dark, empty ballroom and gone through a maintenance door, climb up 13 steps like they were a ladder, go down a dark hallway next to the AC unit, then on the unit itself was three panels a large one and two smaller ones, and Hornbeck had went through the middle door, which was just 14 inches wide, and cold air would have blasted him in the face as soon as he opened it, but yet he still crawled inside and through the ductwork and somehow got past the first rotating fan blade where he made it even further before being hit by the second blade and dying. Why he did this is unknown. March 22, 2002, 15-year-old Robert Williams of Resauvin, a small village in Wales, would leave to a house party about 10 minutes away. He would tell his mother goodbye as he set off. Little could his family know, this would be the last time anyone seen him. When his mother realized something was wrong, a frantic search by police and locals would ensue. They searched the area for days without finding him. Detectives would run down leads and take over 100 witness statements. They also searched the National Fingerprint and DNA database, as well as looking at medical records. Yet, nothing. Not one clue. And that was pretty much it, for over 20 years. But this case is recently very active, when on September 25th, 2023, the news would break that after two decades, a 59-year-old woman and 35-year-old man, who remain unnamed, were charged in connection with Robert's disappearance. They were released later on bail, but this would mean these two people arrested were at the time of the disappearance, a 38-year-old woman and a 14-year-old boy, which makes it seem possible that it was a mother and son. There's not a lot of theories on this one, other than the detectives in 2011 stated he was probably dead. Before this arrest, though, there was a theory that he ran off to join a traveling fair as he had issues at home, and he had actually argued with his mother right before he disappeared. But once the arrest happened, the main theory now is that something happened at that party Robert attended, perhaps an overdose, or perhaps he got too drunk and had an accident, and the woman, who was the age of a mother, helped the son hide the body. Hopefully, we'll know the answer to this one soon. On August 26, 2019, a bus heading from Lincoln to Skegness, both towns in Lincolnshire, England, two young men would be injured in the most bizarre way. It came after they shook the hand of an elderly woman 
that was getting off the bus at her stop in Horncastle, these two men, whose hands had small puncture wounds in them, would both go to the hospital just to get them checked out. The injuries were not serious, but the whole incident is bizarre. And although the injuries were superficial, it was deemed worrisome enough that police actually started looking for the woman that would put out an appeal to the people who witnessed the incident to come forward. They even released photos of the witnesses, and they also stressed these people are not suspects, but it's believed they may have information about the incident. Not much on this one. The woman nor the other passengers have ever been identified, and no one knows why the elderly lady done it. Skyquakes are a phenomenon where a loud booming sound comes from the sky. It may cause noticeable vibration in a building or across a particular area. It's described as being like distant but inordinately loud thunder. While no clouds are in the sky large enough to generate lightning, those who have heard cannons state the sound is nearly identical. They have been heard all over the world and here on the east coast of the US to as far away as Alaska and southern Canada. There's actually several theories for this one. First is that of a coronal mass ejection, which often generates shock waves similar to that of a sonic boom. There's also the thought that meteors entering the atmosphere can cause the sonic booms or military aircraft, although that one doesn't explain the sounds heard before supersonic flight. Then there is the thought that it's gas escaping from vents in the Earth's surface or shallow earthquakes where there is very little vibration but sound is still heard. Then you also have underwater caves collapsing, volcanic eruptions, weather events, or avalanches. The Awful is a super obscure cryptid that comes from the towns of Richford and Berkshire, Vermont. The creature was alleged to be similar to that of a griffin with grayish wings that had a 20-foot wingspan. It also had a very long serpentine tail and enormous claws. It was seen by several people in 1925. The first sighting came from two sawmill workers who were crossing a bridge when they seen this huge cryptid glaring down at them menacingly from a rooftop. It's said that one of the men got so scared he had a heart attack on the spot and had to be carried home where he made a full recovery. Sightings continued over the next few months. Farmers told stories about it soaring over their fields while other residents saw it land on rooftops of their homes. One woman was out hanging up laundry when the family dog started barking like crazy. When she looked to see what the dog was going on about, she seen the awful up on the farmhouse roof staring at her. She ran inside. The cryptid is said to be the inspiration of several stories written by H.P. Lovecraft. Allegedly, he actually visited both towns in 1925 to investigate the sightings, but the sightings started to die down and pretty much stopped by 1928. However, the source that claimed H.P. Lovecraft actually visited the area is another author named H.P. Alberelli Jr. who made the claims in 2006 and never provided a source for where he got this info. And even more sketchy, some researchers state that Alberelli's writings in 2006 are the earliest known mention of the awful, meaning this whole thing is probably a hoax. The Simpsons comic, Find Ned Flanders in this panel, is another Lost Screamer video that was once on YouTube. It was published by user Crystal the Tanacoon. The video showed a panel from a Simpsons comic book called The Yes Man Would Be King. The video is similar to the Where's Waldo game, but instead you try to find Ned Flanders in the comic panel while a sped up version of Watch Out by Bambi plays in the background. When the video reaches 25 seconds, a white girl with large eyes, large pupils, and a bloody mouth from Planet Dolan's 15 creepiest things a child has ever said appears with an extremely loud scream. The video was deleted in November 2018 and is considered lost. On June 6, 1994, Augusta, Georgia, Tiffany Nelson was on the first Monday of summer break. The nine-year-old was happy not to have to worry about heading back to school for at least two more months. She left early that morning, saying goodbye to her aunt and guardian. 
She then jumped on her bicycle and rode down the block to a nearby convenience store slash gas station. The ride was only a quarter of a mile and Tiffany had intended to take it here to the gas station to air up her tires. She made it there sometime around 10 and multiple witnesses would state later they seen Tiffany using the air pumps to air up her tires. Unfortunately, this was the last official sighting. Later, Tiffany's aunt, Ora Parrish, would realize something was wrong when Tiffany had still not came home, so she called the police. Law enforcement would start a door-to-door -door search for Tiffany the next morning. They followed the exact path she would have taken to the convenience store, but this led to nothing. Her picture was then released and circulated amongst the media outlets. The family was not happy with the police, who were less than enthusiastic to search for Tiffany, labeling her a runaway right from the start, and police would get a tip that very day that should have turned the investigation around, but didn't. An 11-year-old boy would tell police that he seen Tiffany in the back seat of a two-door car being driven by a man who was wearing a hat. The sighting occurred just four miles west of where Tiffany was last seen, but police apparently did not find it credible enough to go off of, so they didn't do anything with it. It's also important to note here that this tip contained more details that police have not disclosed to this day, so I'm going to guess that included a description. Regardless, the search for Tiffany was off to a bad start. It would not get any better anytime soon. Ten days later on the 16th, cadaver dogs were brought in to search for Tiffany, which led to nothing. Two days after this, the case was featured on America's Most Wanted. Again, nothing came of it, but a five-man team continued to work the case for the next few weeks, conducting door-to-door -door canvases of the area, hoping to find someone who may have seen Tiffany right before her disappearance. Making matters worse was police still had not found the bicycle she had been riding, and since the bike was missing, it seems that someone in a truck or someone with a sizable trunk would have taken Tiffany and the bike. And crazily enough at this time, the Richmond County Sheriff's Office indicated that they didn't suspect foul play, which possibly contributed to no new leads being developed. Fast forward 11 years to May 16, 2005, two men walking through the woods would stumble across an object they first thought was a bleached turtle shell. Once they picked it up though, they realized it was a skull. Police were called and after excavating the area, they noticed the body had been buried less than 100 yards away from the road in a shallow grave. Tiffany had been found nearly 15 miles south of where she was last seen. Now, a $5,000 reward was announced for any information leading to an arrest, and that's the mystery. Who was responsible for this? One key was that the bicycle was taken with them. It implies that this person convinced her to get into the vehicle and did not outright abduct her, which being 10 in the morning at a gas station on the highway, someone would have most assuredly seen. So at least to the thought that Tiffany knew and was comfortable with this person. Others disagree, however, and try to link the disappearance to other unsolved abductions of young African-American girls in the area around the same time. Her aunt, however, has disclosed that morning she was on her way to work. She passed a man in his mid-40s with a Kangol cap driving around slowly. She stopped to see if he needed directions, and he told her he was looking for a girlfriend. It's something that has haunted her to this day, because Tiffany disappeared only hours later. But another theory comes from Tiffany's brother, Tyrone, who did a stint in prison for drug charges. It seems he had gotten into it with a husband and wife over a drug deal. He then assaulted that man and stole both of their drugs. He was convinced they had done something to Tiffany out of revenge, which might be why no one thought much of it to see his friends talking to Tiffany at the gas station. And her aunt actually recalled detectives brought her down to listen to a 911 call, which was very muffled. Apparently, a little girl called in and said somebody took her from her home and she wanted to go back. The dispatcher asked her who took her, and the muffled reply sounded eerily like the two friends that Tyrone had assaulted. It's been nearly 30 years and the case remains unsolved. March 27th, 1984, Wellington, New Zealand. Caretaker and unionist Ernie Abbott was at the trades hall on Vivian Street. At 5.19 p.m., as he was picking up around the hall, he went to move a suitcase when a loud explosion would rip through the building, killing Ernie instantly. When authorities arrived to the scene, it was quickly figured out 
that the explosion had actually come from a bomb which had been hidden inside the suitcase and left in the foyer of the building. This building was the headquarters for many trade unions who police suspected were the target. The initial theory centered on a bus strike the previous day, but detectives concluded that this bomb, which was designed to explode when moved, would have taken too long to assemble and put back in place so quickly. The attack came during a period of heightened industrial tensions when the Prime Minister made frequent verbal attacks on the union movement, and it's thought whoever done this was just an isolated individual with a hatred of unions, but since no clear motive was ever figured out, the case was never solved. In recent years, police have identified the main suspect, a man named Peter Dykstra, a former public servant familiar with explosives who held a grudge against organized labor. In recent years, he actually provided DNA to the police in a renewed investigation, and it was compared to that found on the suitcase. However, nothing has been disclosed about their findings. The Triassic Kraken is an alleged gigantic squid or octopus-like creature hypothesized by paleontologist Mark McNinneman to have existed in the Triassic era. This comes from a large fossil site found in Nevada that contained various bones of a very large ichthyosaur. The bones were arranged in a curious unnatural pattern, and in 2011, McMiniman argued that the pattern was the work of a Triassic Kraken, in which he said was making a portrait of its own tentacles. Yes, you heard that correctly. He would take it a step further in 2013, when he claimed he found the Triassic giant squid beak as evidence, and he stated the animal was the size of a school bus. There was actually significant media coverage of this alleged Kraken artwork discussed by McMiniman, but scientists, not surprisingly, were unimpressed. They pointed out to numerous other normal theories as to why the bones had been found in that pattern, and also pointed out the cephalopods do not create artwork outside their dens, like the supposed Kraken. Instead, the debris collected around the entrance is scattered randomly and serves as camouflage. And for that beak he claimed he was in possession of, he was only five centimeters long. Does not match up at all with the school bus sized creature he is alleging that it came from, meaning it's most likely a misidentification. This mystery revolves around a Redditor that was either mentally ill or one of the best trolls in history. The story starts off with a post on r slash unresolved mysteries, which brings up another post by u slash snap fingers, in which the person, who according to other users, is a female, claims to be entering the Paris catacombs for a very bizarre reason. This Redditor, according to her post, borrowed a vehicle which she kinda implied that she actually stole it because she said she was not proud of what she did and left a note in the vehicle explaining why she had taken it. She would also thank another Redditor for calling a guy who could start a car without keys, so... Anyway, this is where things get a bit crazy. She would go on to say she will post a video of the destruction of a portal inside the catacombs as well as making a tutorial on how to do so. She would then thank her Discord friends who helped her uncover all the information that led to the portal. She then stated it would be a day or two before she could return with her videos. She then closed by saying the catacombs explorers, known as cataphiles, which we discussed in a previous video, would attempt to hinder her travel, which cannot happen. She stated that these individuals had an extremely high probability of being possessed due to their extended exposure of living in the portal epicenter, so she would be wary of their threats. So. How in the world did we get to this? Well, we need to go further back into her post history, which is certainly interesting. It seems to involve someone who is very disconnected from reality. For example, one post, she would ask how much of oneself is required to get interdimensional beings to leave you alone. She would then tell about these beings that she kept seeing and how her friends on Discord were saying that she would need to make a sacrifice to get them to leave her alone which we will elaborate more on in a second. But in another disturbing post, she would ask if it was possible to reattach a finger if she bit it off because she needed to. She also spoke of sticking a power drill into her arm after seeing black mass come out of nowhere and engulfing it. She was trying to stab the mass when she inadvertently stabbed her arm. 
I'm not going to go through every disturbing post she made, because there's just too many. I will say this though, she seemed to be hallucinating and refused to take medication. She also apparently ran a discord where she talked about all these crazy things that she was witnessing, and they gave her advice, or should I say, they trolled her. That's right, a lot of these people were from 4chan, and they just wanted to troll her. So these users would always give the worst advice. Well, not all of them. Some of them would actually tell Snapfingers she needed psychiatric help. But back to her main mystery. How did she end up at the Paris Catacombs? That would start from a post on Reddit when she asked if there really was a hell portal down in the catacombs. She believed they were responsible for the release of swarms of interdimensional beings that were spread out all over the world. She would claim she had saved enough money for a flight and equipment to go to the catacombs to shut down the portal. Once she figured out how to, which is why she was asking for advice. Some trolled her, others tried to give legit advice, but at some point, she would make a really long post about how she ran into some problems, and basically, describe what sounded like being taken to some psychiatric facility. She stated they had taken her pickaxe from her that she intended to use to destroy the portal, then describe leaving and how she had no money for shelter or food and was realizing this was all a mistake. Then, she made an entire sub dedicated to destroying this alleged portal in the catacombs. Anyways, we come back to the original post, where she spoke of stealing a car, getting to the catacombs, and will be releasing videos of the portal's destruction in a couple of days. The mystery comes after this because, well, she never posted again. So we're left with the theories. Was this the work of an elaborate troll? Or was this a person who had severe mental problems that was trolled by people pretending to help her who realized too late that it had went too far? Or did she get arrested trying to enter the catacombs? Or did she get taken away back to the psychiatric hospital again? Or did she get lost in the catacombs and die? August 15th, 1988, in Kingston, New York. The decomposed body of a man in a wooded area near a cemetery would be discovered. Upon calling authorities, it was quickly determined the man had died from a gunshot wound to the head, which had probably occurred about four days to possibly a few weeks before. Detectives would try to find an ID to notify family when they realized he was not carrying one, and this would start a mystery that has still not been solved 35 years later. No one knows who this man is. Although this happens sometimes, there was one odd clue about this John Doe. In his pocket was a picture of a man holding a baby. Now, it's not even sure if the man in the picture is this John Doe, although if it's not, it kind of makes the whole thing weirder. The man was about 40 to 50 years old, 5 foot 11 to 6 foot 3, 185 to 205 pounds, and his clothing labels suggest that he was from Europe. The mystery is obviously who this man was, but we also have no idea why he was murdered or who was in the photo. One theory is the killer left it behind as a memento, or it could have been a random picture left to throw authorities off the trail of the real killer. And with robbery ruled out, another theory that is speculated about is the man was running from someone in Europe who finally caught up with him, or had the connection to have him murdered in New York. A similar theory states that he was murdered by someone with mob connections in New York at the request of the mob in Europe. This cryptid story goes back to the early days of the North American settlers who first started making their home in the state of Oregon. According to early reports, and it was heavily reported, giant crustaceans were known to inhabit the area in and around Wallawa Lake just south of the town of Joseph. The first account came in an 1885 article in the Wallawa Chieftain, which gave an account from an unnamed goat prospector who claimed to have seen a long-necked beast with a flat head gliding through the water near his boat. Sporadic sightings of this creature would continue for decades. It was described as resembling a Chinese dragon or a black humpback serpent. The crabs, if real, would exceed the largest known crabs in size by a great amount. But that's if they exist, because there are no remains that have ever been found that actually prove this thing existed, leaving us to go by the word of the first settlers. Which brings up another question. Why would they just make it up? And assuming they were real, what happened to them? Well, considering it's been over a hundred years since the last sighting, they're most likely extinct. Although others contend 
they migrated, or they never existed in the first place. Christmas, 1964, at 1.25am, Mildred Head would awake to the sound of something on her roof, and no, it was not Santa. Instead, in her ceiling, she heard what sounded like twigs brushing up against the tiles, only getting louder and louder until it started to sound like giant hailstones. She would run over to the window to see what was making all the noise, but she did not see anything. Then, another sound would begin a humming that grew louder before fading away. A few hours later, soldiers at the nearby Nuke Camp Army base would be awoken by a sound they described as a huge chimney stack that had been ripped from the rooftop and scattered across camp. A few hours after this, at 6.30 a.m., a man named Roger Rump and his wife were awoken by another similar noise, this time described as 5,000 tiles on the roof being ripped off and then placed back on with an enormous clatter. At the same time, Marjorie Bai was walking to church when she was knocked to the ground by the force of sound waves. In total, more than 30 individuals would report hearing noises that Christmas morning. But this was only the beginning of a really weird mystery, because for the next decade, the town of Warminster in England would be hit with tons of reports of UFO sightings. And I must point out that this was made more odd by the fact that Warminster is just 15 miles from Stonehenge. Just three months later, after the first occurrences, three families would report the same noises coming from their roofs, along with their windows shaking. Four months later in June, the actual UFO sightings would begin. The descriptions varied, but were usually described as cigar-shaped and covered with winking bright lights. Another sighted twin red-hot pokers hanging downwards, one on top of the other with a black space in between. The paranormal events started to grab headlines, and on a holiday weekend in August, over 8,000 people would flock to the town in hopes of seeing a UFO. One resident would even snap off a picture. Sightings continued too, ranging from a ball of crimson light to a terrible droning sound. Several books had been written about the Warminster thing, as it became to be known, as well as a documentary that was made. But by the early 70s, sightings dwindled down and the Warminster thing disappeared. And in the 50 years since, no one knows what it was. But there is one main theory. Just northeast of Warminster, it's a place called Waterloo Lines, which is a military barracks and training facility. It's thought that maybe there was some kind of secret military testing going on. July 25th, 1977, Yakima, Washington. An abandoned van in a hardware store parking lot would be searched by employees after a nearby business reported a foul smell coming from the vehicle and they would find something shocking upon opening the door. That of a deceased individual who had been mutilated. Due to being in the van at least two weeks in the middle of the summer, the body was so decomposed that it was initially reported to be that of a man. It was only after the autopsy began they realized it was a woman. This woman would never be identified and it's been hit with setbacks from the get-go. Many of her records, including dental, were lost. Her clothing was accidentally thrown out by a janitor and when her body was exhumed for testing in 2004, the skull was missing due to the fact that it had been sent to the University of Washington for further study in the original investigation, which was the procedure back then. Luckily, they were able to successfully extract DNA from a femur, but that still hasn't helped much and there's still no identity. The victim's death was caused by strangulation, although the victim had been subjected to other abuses, such as being hit on the head three times with a heavy object stabbed, mutilated, and left face down on her hands and knees in the back of the van. And the only theory police have is she may have been a sex worker that met up with the wrong client. It's believed she was around 18 to 28 years old, 5 foot 8 and 130 pounds. She also had a 5 point star tattoo near the top of her inside right thigh, which was odd for that time period. The woman also had her uterus removed, which was odd since she was younger. The van had sat on the fenced in parking lot for over a year and it had not been used because it had bad brakes. However, the owner never kept the door locked, which allowed someone to dump the body off there. This is one of those cases where there were a ton of tips, but none of them panned out. One caller, a notary public, stated a woman came into her office with divorce papers and she thought it might be the Jane Doe. One man called in, saying it was his ex-wife, 
Another man gave the name of a dancer he knew at a strip club, while one detective for the Olympic National Park reached out because a woman had vanished at Mount Rainier. Then, there was the owner of a cafe that thought based on the description, he had seen the woman hanging around in the area. And let's stop there for a second, because I want to elaborate on that part. The words, based on the description. See, her body was in such poor condition that a composite sketch could not be made, nor was there a portrait taken. So not only did she not have a name, she did not have a face. It's like she never existed. However, authorities did believe one thing about her. They were almost certain she came from out of town and probably had not been in Yakima very long. They believed this because again, if she was a sex worker, the majority of them in Yakima were from out of town. One detective estimated around 90%. The whole area at this time seemed to be a place for drifters. A code case team is currently working on this one, but it's going to be an uphill battle trying to find an identity. Tammy Lynn Leppert of Rockledge, Florida was an 18-year-old with a bright future ahead. She had already modeled most of her late childhood and teenage years, making an appearance on the CoverGirl magazine in 1978. She was used to this. She had competed in nearly 300 beauty pageants and had been competing since the age of four. But as she got older, she would begin to receive minor roles in movies such as Spring Break before landing another minor role on the huge film Scarface and it's this movie that would be her last. But let's go back to the shooting of the film Spring Break, because when it wrapped up, she would go to a weekend party, and according to her close friend, she left that party a completely different person. This friend stated that when he asked her what had been bothering her since the party, she would always try to change the subject or say nothing and laugh it off, refusing to even speak about it. As mentioned, she would land a minor role in the film Scarface, and it's here the story takes a really bizarre turn, because after the fourth day of filming, Tammy would show up suddenly at home. Her mother said she was acting paranoid, and Tammy asked her, What would you say if I told you somebody was trying to kill me? Her mother asked if that's what she thought was going on, and she said yes. She believed this so much that she became overwhelmed with the thought of it. It was then that the casting director called her mother to tell her that Tammy had a breakdown on set after seeing artificial blood spurred out in a scene. They mentioned how she started crying hysterically and how it got so bad they had to take her to a trailer where she started going on about an alleged money laundering scheme and people wanting to kill her. They recommended she take Tammy to a doctor to find out if she was having some kind of mental health issue and or the police to see if she really had witnessed something. They would first go to the sheriff but Tammy never once reported to him that her life was in danger nor did she speak about a crime. But her paranoia grew worse. She was now convinced someone was trying to put poison in her food or drink. Her mom would later state, She was normal on some days, but others was extremely on edge. On July 1st, it went too far. She accidentally locked herself out of the home and proceeded to smash all the windows in the house trying to get back in. She also attacked a family friend. Her mom, of course, checked her into a mental health facility for a complete evaluation. But doctors found no evidence of drug or alcohol use and released her after three days. And here's where things get spooky. Not long after this little incident, Tammy would go to Cocoa Beach on July 6th with a friend. She would tell this friend, Keith Roberts, that she might be going away for a while without going into further detail. Keith would later state he thought she was referring to her planned trip to California to film a movie. But about five miles from her home, Tammy would get upset and get into an argument with Keith. She had apparently asked to borrow $500, and on top of that, she wanted him to drive her two hours away to a friend's home in Fort Lauderdale, which he refused, and that upset her. She would tell him to pull over and drop her off in a parking lot. This would be the last time anyone seen her. She did make some calls, one to her aunt, whom said she sounded like she was really afraid of somebody. Yet her aunt was out of town at the time, but she tried to reach other relatives back home to go help her, yet nobody could find her. Her mother would then file a missing persons report five days later, and an investigation would be launched. The detectives interviewed Keith, since he was the last person to see her when he gave her the ride, and pretty quickly, they were able to rule him out, which upset Tammy's mother, who claimed that Tammy had told her she was afraid of him. But it gets stranger, because after her disappearance, the detective working the case would receive two phone calls from a woman claiming that Tammy 
was indeed alive. The first call said, Tammy was okay, and would call them when the time was right. The second call stated, Tammy had entered school to become a nurse, which you know, seems kind of odd. The case has now went unsolved for 40 years, and it's really kind of hard to believe. There's only a couple of theories as well. First, was that of a serial killer named Christopher Bernard Wilder, who the FBI has linked to at least 12 murders from Florida to California. He was known to lure women with the promise of photographing them for magazines. He actually died in a shootout with police in 1984. Tammy's mother had actually filed a civil suit against him for being responsible for her disappearance before this, but she actually stopped the suit as she had some doubts as to whether he was really involved or not, and investigators for their part have never linked him to the case. The second person of interest was a man named John Crutchley. He was suspected of killing as many as 30 women. He committed suicide in prison in 2002 and was never officially linked to her disappearance either. Tammy's mom would later start to theorize that she had not been killed by a serial killer at all, but could have been murdered due to her knowledge of local drug trafficking. Detectives, however, have stated that after talking to a number of her close friends, Tammy had told them she was having a lot of problems at home and she wanted to leave. In fact, she had told one friend she was leaving the day she turned 18, which a lot of kids say. But apparently Tammy and her mother argued quite a bit over what she should do for her career, and I'm not sure, but I get the feeling that her mother was pushing her to pursue Hollywood. As far as theories go, there's a few. Obviously, the big one is mental illness. Schizophrenia is the one mentioned the most, since it usually develops around that age. Of course, that doesn't explain where she went or what happened to her. I guess her suicide, or accidentally dying, or just becoming homeless, or winding up somewhere else and starting a new life. I think the interesting part with the mental illness theory is that Tammy's mother said after they released her from the facility, they stated she passed the drug test, which is good, but I can't find anything about what they thought about her mental health and since medical records are private, and since Tammy's mother never stated if she received a clear bill of health or not, well, it makes you wonder if maybe her mother refused to believe it. I mean, her mother did accuse several different men of being responsible, and even up to the day before her mother died, she was writing a script about this grand cabal in Florida that was covering up the murder of her daughter who witnessed something she shouldn't have. And while those conspiracies do happen, Tammy's behavior before she disappeared seemed to be more than that. However, some think she truly did witness something which gave her PTSD, and the filming of the bloody scene triggered something in her that kept her in a permanent state of anxiety. Others, however, believe she joined the witness protection program, while some believe she started hitchhiking back home after her friend dropped her off and she got into the vehicle with the wrong person. And finally, some believe she fled her overbearing mother and chose to live a much more discreet, simple life. August 26, 2009, 19-year-old David Metzler, a student in Virginia Tech's College of Engineering, was talking to his roommates about plans to take out his girlfriend, 18-year-old Heidi Childs, who also went to Virginia Tech, out on a special date. His plan was to take her to Jefferson National Forest, where he would play music for her and they could talk. The night came along and the couple left at around 7.25 p.m. and took off to what is one of the largest areas of public land in the eastern United States. The area David planned to take Heidi, though, was called the Caldwell Fields Family Ground, about 15 miles from campus. It's a destination common among hikers and tourists familiar with the area, but it is a bit out there. The fields are off a dirt road, and it's surrounded by heavy forest and mountain peaks. Cell phone service is spotty, while the closest business is a summer camp a few miles away. They would arrive at 8.15 p.m., and didn't plan on staying out late because they had classes early the next morning. Now what happened next is part of the mystery and it's still unknown to this day. But what is known is around 8 a.m. the next morning, a man walking his dog found the teen's bodies. David was in the driver's seat with glass scattered in the gravel. He had been shot through the driver's side window. Heidi's body was discovered outside the vehicle and she had been shot in the face. Around the car, 30-30 shells littered the gravel parking lot. Investigators arrived and sealed off the scene and started their investigation, and it's one they've kept close to the vest. And although it did take them years to admit it, they finally disclosed that Heidi's purse, her cell phone, camera, ID card, Virginia Tech lanyard, 
and credit card were all missing, and that credit card has never been used. A task force made up of local, state, and federal authorities was created along with a $70,000 reward for information. The first press conference revealed that the investigators had touched DNA evidence they were sure belonged to the killer, probably from opening the car door. The sheriff would ask the public's help in identifying the owners of six vehicles, a green sedan, possibly a Ford Taurus or Dodge Intrepid, a dark blue Dodge Caravan, a dark colored van or minivan, a dark colored Ford Crown Victoria or Chevy Caprice, a red or red and white Dodge Extended Cab Pickup with dual exhaust, and finally, a gray or cream colored early 2000s model Pontiac Bonneville. These vehicles were all spotted in the area between 6 p.m. and midnight. And I'm not sure, but I think police were looking for these vehicles because these people may have seen something that could help the investigation, and not that they were suspects themselves. Regardless, nothing came from it and the case went cold. It would be a decade later that at a press conference, a representative of the Virginia State Police stated they knew there were some people in the area that knew exactly what happened, and they were hoping they would come forward. On top of this, the reward increased to $100,000. Investigators believe the killing was random. The kids had been in school for two days, not enough time to upset someone so much as to plot this. They also revealed what few locals lived in the area were all ruled out by DNA. But that has not helped the case, and it is still unsolved, which brings us to theories. The most popular theory has always been that they drove up on someone and saw something they shouldn't have seen. Maybe a drug deal. The person or persons then felt they had to silence the witnesses. However, this has basically been ruled out because you can see a car light from a mile down the road and any illegal activity would have been hidden way before the couple arrived. The next theory revolves around the possibility of a hunter, hence the 30-30 hunting rifle. One thought was that a poacher accidentally shot David and then panicked and killed Heidi as well, or just made the cold-blooded decision that she had to be silenced too. But the problem with this theory is, that area is so isolated that a poacher could just go out and hunt in the middle of the day without fear of being caught, so he would probably not be out so late poaching. The second theory was, well, what if someone intentionally went to this well-known lover's lane to wait on a couple just to kill them, like the Zodiac? The problem with this one was there were no similar crimes over the next decade, and that's not typically how these killers operate. The authorities have stated in recent years that they have specific individuals they are pursuing in relation to the case, yet they've never stated a name. But there are rumors. One may be that of Jesse Matthew, a murderer who was operating in Virginia at the time. However, the MO didn't match. And then, and I'm so tired of this guy's name popping up, but Israel Keys is another name bandied about online. He was known to travel thousands of miles to avoid detection of his crimes, and he also stole ID from his victims, and he was unaccounted for on the day of the murders. On September 30th, 1992, Mado Ishikawa, Japan, 20-year-old Chiho Anjitsu, would go to the swimming school in which she worked. The day was normal like any other, and she would leave work that night at 7.15 p.m. Now, as mentioned, the day was normal, but there were a couple of little oddities, such as she had brought her own lunch to work that day, but the swimming school had provided the staff with lunch, and she decided to eat it instead, and it was late that she would be seen eating it in a rather hurried fashion before leaving the building. And then the second oddity, instead of leaving the parking lot towards her home, like she usually did, she went the opposite way, and why she did that is unknown. It would be later that night, hours after she had last been seen, that her mother began to panic. Her mom would call the swimming school before they closed at 10 p.m., and she got only more worried when they informed her that Chiho had left right after her shift hours earlier. And here's where things get eerie. Her mother would drive down to the swimming school to see if they could perhaps find some clue of where she was, and it was to her surprise that she actually found her car parked in its normal spot. Sorta. It was actually parked over two spots and had been ran into the concrete bumper block. Inside was Chiho, and at first they thought, or maybe they hoped, she was asleep. The passenger door was locked, so her mother rushed over to the driver's side door, which opened. Chiho was lifeless. Her clothes were dirty, and she had marks around her neck. 
She was cold to the touch. Her mother rushed to call authorities. Investigators would arrive and taped off the scene and began their investigation. The car had been parked in a hurry, obviously. That much was evident from the car being parked in two spots and rammed into the concrete bumper block. But the police also found the key in the ignition. The gear shift and drive and the radio was playing, but the volume was turned all the way down. In the back was her bag, which contained money and other valuables, which lay untouched. The strangest thing, however, was the bottom of the car. It, along with the tires, were covered in dirt, suggesting that someone had taken the vehicle off-road. But taking a look at Chiho, it only got stranger. Her right shoe was missing, and her left shoe was not completely on her foot, but instead set in the floor of the car. Her clothes, as mentioned, were dirty, but especially on her back. A seven-inch hole had been cut into the abdomen of her clothes, as well as a smaller one in the groin area. However, she had no injuries in these areas. Her lunchbox bag had been placed over her to cover up the hose to hide from any passerbys. The marks on her neck indicated she had been suffocated with something. Strangely, there were blades of grass and leaves in the back of her mouth and throat. A man's saliva was also discovered upon her upper body, and she had marks of trauma on her cheek and chin. After talking to co-workers, they discovered one of them had seen her car parked in the spot at 9 p.m., meaning her murder had taken place between 7.30 and around 8.45 p.m. But here's the weirdest part. In Chiho's hair was a leaf, but not just any leaf. It was from a Meta Sequoia, a.k.a. Don Redwood. It's actually an endangered tree, so endangered it was thought extinct until there were some discovered in China in the mid-20th century. But let's get back to the weirder part. These trees are not native to Japan. Investigators would begin searching, and they asked biologists and even the public for help, and it would finally be found. It had actually been planted at an agricultural testing facility, where plants and trees are tested to see how they grow in certain conditions. The facility was actually fairly close to Chiho's home. The area was pretty isolated, and detectives looked over the scene and pretty quickly found her other shoe, along with some of her hair. This was definitely the place. Looking around more, they would end up finding drag marks. Detectives assumed the killer had came up behind her, assaulted her, and then dragged her body back to the vehicle. Detectives were stumped. Chiho had no known enemies and did not live a risky lifestyle. It's because of this they believe she was murdered by someone she knew. The fact he had tried to park her car back in her normal spot after the murder, the fact that he knew she worked there to begin with, then we also go back to her eating in a hurry before leaving. It's like she was meeting someone. There's also the thing about the location, which is very isolated and also known as a private place where couples tend to go. Could she have had a secret boyfriend? Or maybe he was just a friend that wanted more and snapped after she rejected him. The persons of interest, well, there were many at first. Investigators started with a huge pool of over 5,000 people they looked at. That would be soon narrowed down to 1,000 people. However, the chief investigator would state that the police were about 60 to 70 percent sure of who the man was behind it, whereas the chief investigator himself said he was close to 100 percent sure. Now this man, who the investigator could not name publicly, was originally ruled out because he had a strong alibi. However, out of the top 20 suspects, this man's blood type was the only one that matched the saliva left on her body. This turned investigators back onto him a couple of years later, and it was quickly found out his alibi wasn't as strong as first thought. Actually, they found out his alibi was a lie, and he was unaccounted for during the murder. Even worse was early on in the investigation, a witness reported seeing Chiho with this unnamed man in her vehicle, and she was riding on the passenger side while he was driving. Police ignored the tip because it was not around the crime scene. Another woman had actually seen him leaving the car after parking it at the swimming school, but police ignored this woman because she was a fortune teller. This is one of those that law enforcement just botched from the get-go. June 30th, 2001, Grand Island, Nebraska. Jason Jolkowski would be called into his job early. The 19-year-old worked at the Fazoli's restaurant while he went to school at Iowa Western Community College part-time, where he intended to eventually become a radio DJ. Since Jason's car was in the shop at the time, and since he only lived four miles away from work, he at first thought 
about walking to the restaurant, but he eventually talked to a co-worker who offered to give him a ride. Jason had a hard time giving directions, possibly due to the fact he had a mild learning disability related to speech and language, and he just asked the co-worker to meet him at the local high school, which both of them had previously attended. Plus, it was just a half a mile from his home. At 10.45 a.m., he would walk out carrying his red work t-shirt and was spotted by his neighbor, who seen him helping his little brother pull trash cans from the curb back to the house. And 30 minutes later, between 11.15 and 11.30 a.m., the co-worker would call Jason's home and ask Jason's brother why Jason had not met her at the school like he said he would. I have to point out here too, the sources vary a little. Some sources claim that this employee went back to the restaurant and the boss called the family home and asked Jason why he had not met with her, while another source says she called the boss to report Jason did not show up and then he called the home. Regardless, Jason did not meet this girl waiting on him at the school and Jason has been missing ever since. And unfortunately for his parents, they mistakenly believed they had to wait 24 hours before they could report it. And once they did, they claimed the police waited 10 days before looking because they believed he was a runaway, even though he had never done that before, and even though he was not a troubled teen. His family feared an accident had occurred and was covered up, or was an abduction. And if you're thinking maybe something happened between the co-worker and Jason at the school, well, detectives thought that too, but they pulled the school security video, which revealed Jason never even arrived at the school. This one is a really odd one, and this one is one of the most baffling missing person cases in the U.S. in the past 30 years. Jason was a pretty quiet guy and didn't have a large circle of friends and no known enemies. He left $650 behind in an account, which has never been touched again. He did not cash any paychecks from his last job, nor did he pick up his car from the auto shop. He was not involved with drugs or alcohol, and that's pretty much it. There's so little to work with, no witnesses or evidence of any kind leading theories to be based on nothing but speculation, and that's what we'll look at in the first one, and that is, someone lured him into a vehicle that day and then assaulted and murdered him. Some argue against this theory, since Jason was shy and cautious, but his family said he was too trusting. Other opponents of this theory point out that Jason was 19 and 6 foot 1 and is not really the target for a sexual predator, which might be kind of sexist because anyone can be a victim to these kinds of attacks. The strange thing, though, was it was just a half a mile from his home and on a quiet residential street with very little traffic. It's hard to believe he could be abducted here, which leads to the thought that he wasn't lured into a vehicle at all. Some have speculated that perhaps a neighbor took advantage of his trust and lured him into the home. There are a few other theories that have been speculated about at one time or another, but have all been basically ruled out at this point. First was that Jason got hit by a reckless driver who then threw him in the car and sped off. But considering how quiet this neighborhood was, this was unlikely. Secondly, was the thought that Jason fell into a manhole, which, as ridiculous as that sounds, has happened before, but that one's basically ruled out as well. A final one is the girl that was supposed to pick Jason up had a boyfriend or ex, depending on the source, that intended to scare Jason because he did not want them riding together. But obviously, the thing that rules this one out is Jason was called into work at the last minute, and the car ride had not been planned. July 30th, 1985, Toronto, 8-year-old Nicole Morin would go down to the lobby to pick up the mail and then return back to her apartment to get ready to go to the swimming pool with a friend. Her mother Jeanette was busy with other small children that morning as she ran a small daycare group in the apartment. Meanwhile, Nicole would speak to her friend via the intercom and stated that she would see her in the lobby shortly. She then walked out of the apartment around 11 a.m. wearing a one-piece bathing suit and carrying a plastic bag container with her other clothes. Fifteen minutes after this, her friend buzzed the apartment again and asked Nicole's mother why Nicole had not made it down yet. Her mother, who was busy taking care of the small children, assumed that Nicole had just went to the pool by herself or went to the rear of the apartment to play with some other children. And because of this, she did not call the police. It would actually be four hours later, around 3 p.m., she finally did realize something was wrong and called, although some sources state that she didn't call until 7 p.m. The police actually responded quickly 
and with a lot of manpower, they began actively searching and canvassing all the apartments in the complex. They set up roadblocks around the building and circulated vehicles with public address systems alerting the residents to the missing child's description. They knocked on every door in the complex that Nicole lived in, and they entered the ones that no one answered the door. One woman would identify Nicole based on a photo the police showed her, and she would recall seeing her traveling down the elevator and entering the lobby. From there, the trail went cold. The next day, a dragnet consisting of mounted horsemen, marine units, helicopters, and foot patrols began combing an area near the highway in the vicinity. Tracking dogs were also brought in to explore the building's underground garages, utility rooms, and storage units. A neighbor would also come forward with information, saying that she had seen an unknown blonde woman with a notebook on the floor of Nicole's apartment just 45 minutes before she disappeared. Police hoped this woman could be a good witness, but she was never identified and never came forward. 900 residents would help search, while thousands of posters and flyers were circulated around the city. He would go down as one of the biggest searches in Toronto history. A 20-member task force investigated the case for nine months, investing 25,000 man-hours running down leads. 6,000 people were questioned. The whole thing cost an estimated $2.8 million. The family and acquaintances, for what it's worth, were all cleared early on. Although strangely, police found out later on that Nicole had written in her diary months before a curious statement that just said, I'm going to disappear. But investigators think that was just more of a kid being a kid than a real clue. In the nearly 40 years since, she has not been found, nor has a suspect emerged. But the main theory seems to be that someone in that complex lured her into his apartment, and from there, it's hard to speculate. But if he did kill her, he would have had at least a few hours to get her body out of the apartment before the search even began. There's also the less believed theory that someone not living in the complex somehow abducted her. And that brings us to the conclusion of this installment of the Unsolved Mystery Mega Iceberg Explained. I hope you all enjoyed. Goodbye and good night.